Hello, my name is Jörg Rössler. I'm an accredited Kanban trainer from Germany. I run my own business called Egeria Consulting, in which I'm helping my clients with Kanban and business agility, not only to make them more competitive, but also to create work environments in which people enjoy working. Besides that, I'm a professor at several universities where I teach Kanban and business agility as well. Apart from my home market, Germany, I do a lot of business in Latin America, which already brings us to the topic of my talk today. I would like to show you which challenges you might face once you apply Kanban across cultures. Let me give you some information on the structure of my talk. I want to give you some very brief information on why this topic is of a certain relevance. Then I would like to show you the not so short disclaimer of this talk. I will explain you later why it is relatively extensive and I will also explain you what is culture. Then I'd like to show you which cultural characteristics have most impact on Kanban. I pick here only the most important ones. And finally, I will provide you with some strategies on how to master intercultural challenges. After that, we have time for questions. One more thing before we start. I would like to thank the organizers of Enterprise Kanban Everywhere for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So why is this talk relevant? Of course, I can tell you now that the world got smaller, that communication travel costs dropped, and that we have, in consequence, more Kanban teams working across borders, time zones, and cultures. However, I would like to point out another detail. I was doing business in four to five Latin American countries. Now with Corona crisis, I'm suddenly doing business in 10 different Latin American countries. Why? Well, as we now have a better acceptance of online training, the barriers to enter new markets are really low. So now I do business in countries where I never expected it. That of course might not apply to everyone, but it might apply to some of you. Thus coronavirus could also make our business even more international and thus creating more intercultural scenarios. Let's first have a look on what is culture. Of course, there is no definition everybody could agree on. So I will give you a couple of different definitions. Culture is the way we view things and do things around here. That definition focuses very much on customs, habits, or rituals. This one is from the well-known Gerrit Hofstede. Culture is the collective programming of the mind that distinguishes the members of one group or category of people from another. For Hofstede, culture is like the software running on the hardware that would be the human being. Kluckhohn and Strutbeck define culture like this. Every man is in a certain aspect like all, some and no other man. Now you might ask, where does culture appear in this definition? Well, characteristics that are human and characteristics that are only individual are not cultural. Culture is everything in between. In other words, culture is something that a group has in common. An orientation system handed over from one generation to another that helps to master the challenges of the environment. I find this definition really interesting because sometimes people think that culture is something that just happens randomly. According to this definition, however, culture is the response to an environmental challenge. Culture is a decision framework. Culture impacts how we act, make decisions, prioritize and judge. For example, if, is it okay uh, in your company culture to take a break whenever you want to? Can you just get up, take a coffee and chat with your colleagues for 30 minutes? To sum it up, culture is something that is not random, but often has a logical explanation and benefits. It is shared by a group of people. It gives you orientation and helps you mastering the environment. It helps you to make decisions and it is carried over from one generation to the next one. There are many different approaches to describe the structure of culture, but it always has to do with layers. I will introduce you to the most basic one, percepta and concepta. There is a layer that represents the surface of culture. Here you find basically everything that you could perceive when traveling to another country. That's why it's called percepta. Here we can find behaviors such as rituals, ceremonies, customs, social interaction, and the results of these behaviors 
such as architecture, clothing, art, and any other artifact. Below that layer, we find concepta. This is what you won't see when traveling to another country, such as norms, taboos, values, or beliefs. Concepta are the reason for the behaviors that form percepta. Let me give you a simple but yet interesting example for culture. This is culture. What do you see here? Most likely you're going to say that you see a cube. Well, you're looking at a two-dimensional surface. There can't be a three-dimensional object. What we actually have here is a square with two rhombi. The fact that you see that as a three-dimensional object is nothing else than culture. This is not natural, but a cultural artifact. Look at these two paintings. One is medieval and the other one is Egyptian. Both have nothing three-dimensional. Only in the Renaissance, painters started to use vanishing lines to indicate depth of room. That is why you just saw a cube. If you were showing this drawing of the cube to a tribe that has never been exposed to our Western culture, they would see, well, a square with two rhombi. As we clarified now what culture is, let's get to the disclaimer. In a few minutes, you'll see why the disclaimer is so important. Well, first disclaimer, we all have a cultural bias. There are no cultureless or culture-free people. We all were born into a culture and raised in a culture. And we are only able to see the world through the eyes of our culture. You can try as hard as you want to be objective, but you just can't. There is no way to escape the cultural bias. You don't believe that? Well, let's say you're investigating how punctual people are in different cultures. That alone is already a cultural bias. Why? Because your study design is biased. Probably you come from a culture where punctuality is important. That's why you're comparing cultures with regard to their punctuality. Someone who's from a culture where punctuality is not important would never get to the idea of comparing punctuality across cultures. The second disclaimer. Most available studies focus on national cultures. We do not take into account that this is just one level of culture. Above, we can find supranational uh, cultures, such as the one of Germany, Austria, and uh, the German part of Switzerland, or the Cono Sur, which consists of Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay. Below the national cultures, we find regional cultures, such as the culture of the Basque country. And of course, we can find so many other levels of culture, such as corporate culture, industry culture, project culture, department culture, minority cultures, and so on. In other words, we mostly focus on just one level of culture, but actually there are existing so many of them. The third bias. The average or the most frequent observation don't tell you anything about the individual. I'm going to use our example punctuality again. Let's say you're observing when people are entering a conference room. You're counting now how many people show up in every minute uh, starting 20 minutes before until 20 minutes after the scheduled beginning of this meeting. If you do that, we can observe that many Swiss are there five minutes before the scheduled starting time, a few even earlier and a few later. Now let's have a look on a fictitious observation of Argentinians. Many of them show up five minutes after the scheduled meeting time, some even later. Now you can conclude from your study that Swiss are overpunctual and Argentinians are late on the average, of course. However, when you apply this to your next meeting with an Argentinian and a Swiss client, you might have a meeting with this kind of Swiss and this kind of Argentinian. Your assumption will be totally wrong. By the way, I was once entering a meeting room with five Colombians waiting already for me, and they really enjoyed pointing out that they were waiting for so-called super punctual German. The fourth disclaimer. We usually don't know the distribution of the data that was collected for a study. Let's use our previous example again. 
if the distribution looks like the one on the left side, we can actually say with a certain confidence that most Argentinians are late. But what about the distribution on the right side? Here, our assumption that Argentinians are notoriously late is not that robust. And another disclaimer, culture is not consistent. Not everything in the culture is logical. Some values might be contradicting. Cultures usually withstand these contradictions and find ways how to deal with these inconsistencies. The Declaration of Independence and the at this time still existing slavery are not consistent. Uh, in many societies, freedom and equality are highly esteemed values. However, this is inconsistent. You can't have freedom and equality at the same time. If someone becomes rich, he used his freedom to pursue a good business, but now he's not equal anymore and we would need to take parts of his wealth away from him and redistribute it in the society. And like this, we could reach equality, which of course would hurt his freedom again. Why did I show these five disclaimers? And be assured, there are many more of them. Well, when doing cultural studies, there are two dangerous issues, stereotyping and oversimplification. Please don't think that all people from a certain culture always behave as the studies are indicating. And please don't think that there is always a straightforward and simple explanation for everything. Culture is by far too complex for that. In this third part of my talk, I would like to throw the two things together, Kanban and intercultural scenarios. Therefore, I will pick uh, a couple of uh, typical elements of Kanban and show you how they are impacted by culture. Um, I will try to work also always with examples from my personal uh, background or from my personal experience uh, that do not necessarily have to do uh, with Kanban or even uh, uh, won't have a business context, but will illustrate uh, how culture works. And then I will explain you finally uh, how they impact the, the given Kanban setting. Let's start with a Kanban principle, which is called manage the work, let people self-organize around it. For sure, everybody has heard about that. So we're talking here about self-organization. Micromanagement and assigning tasks on a daily basis is not what we necessarily want in Kanban, okay? We have service classes that highlight priorities and we have the Kanban meeting so that the team can coordinate its work. Therefore, we do not need managers to tell everybody what to do in which moment. Self-organization is a much more efficient approach to organizing work. So let me give you an anecdote that happened many years ago. I had an apartment in Colombia that I was sharing with a local guy and we had a maid. She prepared lunch for us and I told her to sit with us on the table and have lunch with us together. After lunch, the guy who I, who I was sharing the apartment with took me aside and told me that I please should never do that again. Maids don't eat at the table, they eat in the kitchen. And they, don't, they eat after us so that they can attend us or serve us during lunch. So this is an example for power distance. In some societies, we strive for equality and flat hierarchies. In others, inequality is accepted from both sides, the powerful and the rich, and, but also from the side of the powerless and poor. In the figure, you can see some examples for power distance. You find particularly low power distances in Scandinavian countries and relatively low power distances in most Anglo-American countries. In many other countries, power distance is high to very high. If you have been doing business with people from India, for instance, this phrase might sound very familiar to you. I have to check back with the boss. Okay, that basically means you have no decision power and you won't dare to make a decision. 
In the contrary, connected to our culture, you might have heard the phrase, it is better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for, per uh, for permission. Well, self-organization requires empowerment. If people are not allowed to make their own decisions and if they grew up in a culture where making own decisions means an attack uh, on the competency or uh, the position of others, it will be quite challenging to motivate these people to be self-organized. Let's have a look on the replenishment meeting. Uh, in the XIT case study, we can see that different product managers came together to discuss which items should enter the workflow. From my point of view, there were two success factors for a good replenishment. The first one is it should be done in an adequate frequency. Um, so in other words, the uh, more often you replenish, the more agile, uh, agile you are. Okay. Um, the second success factor is you should have a certain diversity among the participants. There should be managers from different uh, departments representing the business needs, but also people with a technical background who can give you valuable input with regard uh, to how to implement uh, the work from a technical point of view. Okay. Um, if we have a certain diversity of people and therefore also a, a diversity of interests, it is obvious that harmony will not always be a guiding principle in such a meeting. Uh, moreover, the participants will struggle for a common solution and a certain degree of conflict is key to finding the best solution. Well, let me give you again an example from my personal intercultural experiences. This happened really so many times to me. When somebody should deliver something on a certain date, but doesn't, and you follow up. In certain culture, communication simply breaks down completely. Well, that person does not reply to your emails or text messages and also doesn't answer the phone. He or she just disappears completely. What is the reason for that behavior? Well, you might be dealing with a culture that is averse to conflict. Okay. In our Western culture, conflict is sometimes positively attributed. It solves problems. It uh, gives us a clear view on what is wrong. It helps us to clarify positions uh, and it might be perceived as a first step uh, for implementing a solution and so on. Okay. However, in many Asian or Latin American cultures, conflict is solely attributed negatively. A conflict is a threat to the personal relationship. In China, people would say that both conflict parties could lose their face. Therefore, your strategy in a conflict averse culture with regard to conflict is to avoid it whenever it might arise. I guess you see already the intercultural challenge, right? If a replenishment meeting is nurtured by different opinions and competing positions, conflict is unavoidable. Okay. It should not get out of control, but it won't always be cozy either. Problems arising from this are twofold. If you don't see a problem in asserting yourself in such a meeting, your counterparts from other cultures that are conflict averse might be shocked. For them, you're just rude or you lost your dignity in their eyes because of your inappropriate behavior. Another problem that might happen is that people from conflict adverse cultures do not reveal their true opinions or needs or requirements to avoid conflict. However, the success of a replenishment meeting is also impacted by the fact that all issues are really brought to the table. Let's have a look on another key Kanban element, which would be push versus pull. A Kanban system is only a Kanban system if it's a pull system. Okay, that's a no brainer. You can, you can squeeze more and more work into the system. Okay, let me give you another example of an intercultural scenario that I encountered so often. Um, you ask people when they will deliver what and you think, oh, this is never going to happen. 
This plan is so over ambitious and it will never come true. What happens here is that the assumption for planning is not the team's capacity, but what the team thinks that you might expect from them. In other words, planning is far away from reality and the main objective is not making a realistic estimate, but making the requester happy and not saying no. Even uh, if the estimate is not in alignment with our throughput metrics, people will still communicate it. Where does it come from? Well, there are cultures that are monochronic and others are polychronic. In monochronic cultures, people tend to think that time and resources are limited. And these cultures, people will tell you that certain things are simply impossible due to time restrictions. Polychronic cultures tend to think that time is like a chewing gum. You can easily stretch it. In other words, time will expand as to absorb all the required activities. Combining this with a high power distance and a demanding boss will easily turn your pull system into a push system. Let's talk about whip limits. This topic is somewhat uh, similar to the one before uh, because you can not separate whip limits uh, from pull systems. Uh, however, I would like to handle it separately and have a deeper look. Here's another real world example. I recently had a Kanban workshop in a Colombian company and uh, we discussed what is really important and what can be dropped at least for the moment uh, so that we would have less work in, in process. In the end, everything was important and nothing could be dropped. Okay. I tried to explain them that it is better to do a few things fast and finish them completely in a good quality instead of doing many things slowly and in a bad quality. Um, however, there was a lot of resistance because everything was considered to be super important. I even quoted Michael Porter saying that strategy is mostly about what not to do. It didn't help. In the end, a guy stood up and literally said, Hey, we are Colombians. We are used to multitasking and we're really good at it. Um, if required, we work extra hours or we work on weekends. And in the end, we always get things done. It might take a little bit longer and the quality might not be perfect, but we're getting things done in the end. His colleagues mostly agreed. I actually had failed at this time, but I'm still working with that client and be sure that I will try again to convince them uh, of web limits. By the way, after the workshop, a lady walked up to me who had a different cultural background than the other workshop participants. She told me, that she actually thinks that excessive multitasking was a root cause for many problems the organization had, but that she finally gave up because there was too much resistance. Here we have to go back to monochronic and polychronic cultures. Apart from what I already explained, there is another characteristic of the two types of cultures, their attitude towards multitasking, or I should better say excessive task switching. Monochronic cultures think that sequential work is most efficient, whereas polychronic cultures believe in the efficiency of parallel work. By the way, this is also the reason why monochronic cultures value punctuality so much. If others turn in late their results, you can't work sequentially but you need to start new things, then pause them uh, again uh, once your colleague finally delivers. So when working with polychronic cultures, watch out for exceeded whip limits and uh, spreading CFDs. You can use lead time to show that whip limits uh, work actually and that work will be flowing faster if you limit it. Let me get to the last element of Kanban that might be impacted by culture. That is um, 
communication and uh, unhiding work. Communication is uh, crucial in Kanban, not only because of uh, cadences, feedback and uh, Kaizen, uh, but also because of uh, system thinking, uh, which requires an holistic approach um, uh, that wants to take into account interdependencies and uh, of course that requires to talk. Another thing is unhiding work. I heard the term the first time from Brendan Wichko, uh, who is a pretty famous uh, Kanban trainer and I really like the term. Work should not be implicit or hidden, but visualized and transparent. Okay. Let me give you again an intercultural example. I once had a conference call with a lady from Latin America. After a couple of minutes, she said that she sees that I'm short in time and that we could talk another day if I wanted to. I told her that there was no problem. I had reserved time for our call. After a few minutes, she made another attempt telling me that she feels that I'm very busy and stressed and that we could talk later if I wanted to. Finally, I got the message. I'm working since so many years with people from Latin America, but in that particular situation, I was completely blind. What she actually was expressing is that she had no time and wanted to postpone our meeting. She just didn't want to offend me by telling me that she had no time for me now. This situation reflects something that we call context of communication. In low context cultures, we communicate very explicitly. There is not much room for interpretation. We get straight to the point and try to express as clearly as possible what we want to say. In high context cultures, you need to take into account the whole context or the whole uh, environment of the message. Who said it? When was it said? Where was it said? Okay. So you need to add more information from the context to really understand what the message is. Communication usually is totally overestimated in its effectiveness, uh, according to my personal experience. There are so many communication failures, even within the same culture. However, once we are looking at communication between high and low context cultures, it gets even trickier. Low context communicators don't get the message in between the lines, whereas high context communicators feel offended by too much directness. Low context communicators might feel that all tasks have to be visualized, while high context communicators might assume that someone will know and consider. Low context communicators might feel that it is their obligation to proactively pass on information, while high context communicators might wait to be asked. Intercultural communication really is a, well, I don't want to mention the bad B word. Let's say it can be challenging. So far, I was only talking about cultural problems and challenges, but I didn't give you any solution. I will try to do that now but I would like to tell you right away um, that you will be probably disappointed by what I'm going to tell you. Why? Because people usually expect me to give them a checklist or even a manual once I'm talking on intercultural issues. Once you read the manual, you know, for example, how to operate the Japanese. Let me explain you why that approach cannot work. And to do that, I would like to separate two things, rituals and behaviors. Let's have a look on two scenarios. Okay. Scenario one is if you receive a business card in Japan before a meeting, you should not store it in your pocket, but you read it carefully and then place it in front of you on the table. You can actually read in a book how to deal with that situation. And there are rules that you can just follow. This is the case with etiquette, customs, rituals, and habits. Okay, let's have a look on scenario two. You're negotiating with, Japan, with a Japanese delegation. You're stuck and you can perceive literally the tension in the room. You're directly heading towards a conflict. 
Well, in a book, you can read about conflict in Japanese culture, and that might give you a very general idea how Japanese now might tend to act. This knowledge can be beneficial. However, I would say it also can be dangerous. Your book told you that Japanese handle conflict in this or that way. And now the guy in front of you doesn't act according to your book at all. Why? Well, he's an individual and human being. His behavior might be impacted by his Japanese background, but he is not just a robot repeating a typical uh, Japanese stereotype uh, and, and, and behavioral patterns. You're, you actually need to manage the situation now without having a step-by-step -step checklist how pilots would use it in a critical situation. That's why manuals or checklists do not help you anymore once getting beyond etiquette. And that's why I'm probably disappointing you now by not providing you with a checklist that most people usually expect from me. Nevertheless, let me give you now three types of advice on how to act successfully in intercultural scenarios. Okay, so my first advice would be see different actions as a result of different beliefs, concepts or values. It is in our nature to assume that there is only one objective uh, reality and that we all see the same reality. We also assume that we all act based on the same beliefs, concepts or values, which we call concepta. It is simply beyond our imagination that someone could see the world with different eyes. Therefore, we assume that we all need um, to get to the same behavioral results as we are sharing the same concepta. If someone behaves differently, he or she obviously is acting against our shared values. So we are running a logical sequence that you could describe like that. First, we all share the same concepta, which are values, beliefs, convictions, and so on. As we all share the same concepta, we all behave or act foreseeably in the same or similar ways because our actions are a consequence of our beliefs. If somebody acts in a different way, this person obviously is acting against our shared values and beliefs. We have now all the right to be angry on this person or uh, possibly start a conflict because our shared values are the base for our uh, peaceful and organized society life. However, this is wrong. In many cases, different behaviors are a result of different beliefs or values. Let me give you two real world examples for this type of intercultural problems. Let's say refugees from certain African uh, countries are coming to Europe and they meet on the street as a group. While meeting, they sit on or lean against parked cars. The owner of one of the cars sees that and is very angry. Why? Well, the chain of arguments is very simple. These people come to our country and we try to help them. They know that it is wrong to sit on other people's cars. Um, they do it anyway. So they are acting in an offensive and disrespectful way. And we're trying to help them. Well, in our culture, we have a strong belief that private property has to be respected and may not be touched by others. However, in certain cultures, the attitude towards public spaces and whatever is in them is very different. Um, it is normal to use and touch things that are in public areas. Of course, somebody coming to our countries as a refugee should become familiar with our rules. However, there is a better explanation for their behavior than the one saying that they are bad people trying to violate our order. Let me give you a second example. You're meeting up 
with somebody from Latin America. This person shows up 15 minutes late. You're angry now and you think being late is disrespectful. This person doesn't value my time, does not appreciate me as a person and does not take serious our meeting. Everybody should be on time because being punctual is uh, a common shared value in our culture. However, this person from Latin America on the way to your meeting ran into an old friend she hasn't seen for three years. In her culture, um, personal relationship, warmth, uh, social interaction with uh, the group is higher valued than being on time. From her perspective, it would have been really offensive not to sit down with her old friend and talk. In other words, her different behavior is not the violation of your common value base, but the result of different values. From her perspective, she was doing the right thing. When um, being in a stressful situation, uh, our reptile brain takes control. And even though my two uh, examples might sound logical to you, it is not easy to calm down in one of these two situations and to reflect if different values or beliefs might be the source of the conflict. Nevertheless, try to understand motivations the next time you run into an intercultural conflict and you might discover that your counterpart is not evil but just has different concepta. My second advice is develop situational awareness. Last year, I was picked up at uh, El Dorado by an Uber. This is the airport uh, of Bogota. I talked to the driver and asked him what he had been doing before driving Uber. Um, well, he was a bodyguard for the Colombian military protecting politicians. Well, now we had a really interesting topic. I asked him how he was trained. And of course, I was expecting stories of rival shooting, car chases and martial arts. However, he told me that situational awareness is the most important thing you need as a bodyguard and that this was a major part of the training. You need a high sensitivity for the environment, the setting you are in and the people by who you are surrounded. In other words, you need to be a good observer. He told me that he can't stop doing that after having been a bodyguard for so many years. So he told me that once I got into his car, he checked me out on if I'm nervous, how I keep my hands, if I'm sweating, if I have any red stains on my skin and how I breath. Um, he also looked if I'm right or left handed and in consequence where I could carry a hidden weapon, how I'm dressed, which shoes, which watch I wear, uh, from which social class I might be. Uh, which perfume I use. Uh, he even looked on how I was carrying my bag to see if it might be heavy or not. Okay, so um, you should develop that situational awareness the bodyguard had also when dealing with other cultures. Let me give you two examples. Your counterpart might be increasingly quiet during a conversation or he or she might suddenly change the subject. Maybe your interpretation now is that there is a lack of interest or a lack of focus on the other side. However, you might be dealing with somebody from a culture that is averse to conflict. That person might see a conflict coming and withdraws or changes the subject to avoid conflict. Another example is the meaning of yes. There are cultures in which a no is almost inexistent. The answer will always be yes, even if they mean no. With a high situational awareness and some empathy, you might be able to hear the no in the yes. Always remember, if something feels awkward, in many cases it actually is. So be a good observer of uh, situations and train your situational awareness. Here is my third advice, limited adaptation. 
I often observe two extreme behaviors. One is not to adopt to other cultures at all. It is something like, if they want to do business with me, um, they need to adopt to me. I won't just change to gain a contract. Well, on the other hand, on the other extreme, there are people who are almost ashamed of their own culture and they try to do everything to completely adopt. It might sound like a no-brainer, but I think uh, it is very important to mention that both strategies won't be successful. On the one hand, you need to respect other cultural identities. But on the other hand, it is also not a good idea to deny your own identity. That is because of two reasons. An over-adaptation might make you look ridiculous in the eyes of your counterparts and they might lose respect. The other reason is that you are just acting and you might be able to act for a limited time. But after that, you're falling back into the behaviors associated with your own culture and that behavioral change will make you look inconsistent and unreliable. Have respect, but be yourself and mildly adapt. I guess many of you are disappointed now because you were expecting a recipe or a manual for other cultures. The truth is, even if uh, some will tell you that these checklists exist, they only do exist on an etiquette level, but not at the level of behavior at large. It is a little bit like Kanban. When I got in touch for the first time with Kanban, I was expecting standardized roles, cadences, standardized board and ticket designs and all that. When someone then tells you a good ticket design must allow for a good pull decision, but you are expecting a form, a checklist with everything that needs to be on a well-designed ticket, it is quite disappointing. It took me a while to accept that there are no easy solutions in Kanban and that you can't just copy a board design from another team. You need to find your own way, or should I better say, you need to struggle for your own Kanban system. And then you need to, to evolve in an evolutionary way. The same is true when acting with other cultures. There are no standard solutions and you need to slowly evolve your intercultural skills. Well, thank you, Jörg. That was just a very fascinating talk. Uh, learned learned quite a bit about it so and uh, great. Um, so we got quite a few questions here. Uh, I think it'd be fantastic to hear what you have to say about them. Uh, so most of the people are able to understand the different cultures and implications, but how can we work on changing the mentality of my culture or my culture's values are better than yours. What do you would you have to say to that? Yeah, well, I may talk that uh, the acceptance that different behaviors come from different mindsets or different values is is key to understanding uh, cultural difference and accepting different cultures. So I, I would say, well, I mean, if we're in stressful situations, that is often very hard to say. I mean, when I was talking about it. Um, probably it sounded uh, pretty much logic, but once you get into a stressful situation, it's so difficult uh, to step back and uh, to think, oh, uh, that person is not evil. He or she might be just acting based on different beliefs or values or uh, priorities or mindsets. So I think that this is something that you can't do just like that. It, it, it's something that uh, you need to train. Yeah, that's no, great, great. And I think um, I, I love your conversation about situational awareness and how important that is. Uh, I had a question around, are some cultures more attuned to situational awareness naturally than others? Do you find that to be the case or um, is it more on an individual basis? Than a okay. Culture. Yeah, I think it's a yeah, I think it's on an individual basis. But on the other hand, you could state that there are cultures where uh, social interaction and empathy are more important. Yeah, um, uh, in cultures that are very individual individualistic, 
um, like, uh, uh, yeah, especially Anglo-American cultures, um, uh, people might be a little bit more focused on themselves as an individual and uh, pursuing their own uh, happiness, their own agenda might be more important in those cultures. Uh, whereas in other cultures, um, uh, giving the others a good feeling, uh, having a, a, a good sense of, of, uh, of the group behavior and, and how everybody feels might be more important in, in these cultures. Uh, so you find that behavioral patterns uh, a lot in, in Asian cultures, for example. And uh, yeah, it might be that there's a little bit more empathy there, uh, but it doesn't mean that you necessarily will be able to handle things better. Okay, great, great. Um, you stated that culture is not something random, uh, but a solution to a real problem posed by the environment. What do you exactly mean by that? Could you give a couple examples of, of how, how that has, uh, or how you see that happening? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let me give you a, 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 an example that I encounter a lot. Um, a lot of people in Germany, but also in the rest of Europe, perceive Americans as very superficial, okay? Um, so why are they superficial from, from our perspective? Um, the average American, uh, I, I don't have the number, the exact numbers at hand right now, but the, the, ever, the Americans on the average change like 12 or 15 times during their life, their job and their, uh, their apartment or house. Okay, so if you are very slow in making new contacts, um, you will be very much alone. Okay, so uh, if you're living in a culture where you're constantly changing your environment with regard to job and, 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 and living, you need to be somebody who, who uh, is, is really quick and fast in, in making new contacts. Okay. And exactly that ability to make contacts very fast is perceived in other cultures as being superficial. Okay. Uh, so I think um, what we would maybe call in Germany superficial is a perfect response to the fact that there's a very high degree of mobility in the American society. Okay, so there's really an explanation for that. It's not that Americans are just for some random reasons like they are, but their behavior and their way of making contact uh, with other people is simply the consequence of um, an, an, an environment that uh, is as it is. Okay, great, that's a great example. All right, uh, we have a question here about disclaimer number five, um, saying it, that it's not really fully understanding equality. Um, equality is an opportunity, equality of opportunity is not in opposition to risk taking and wealth accumulation. So equality and freedom are not really in competition. Get your comments on that. Yes, uh, this comment <laughs> for sure is from, from somebody from the US, I guess. Uh, because that's a very American belief to say <clears throat> that um, uh, equality is mostly uh, the equality of opportunities and that, uh, yeah. But uh, let's say, uh, let's look on, on welfare states in, in, in Europe. Uh, there you would say that equality is something very different. Uh, equality is not the equality of opportunities. Equality is that we really need to redistribute wealth. Okay, so that is, so when I was using that example, I was referring to that understanding of equality that uh, we have in many welfare states uh, in Europe. But if uh, for you, equality is what that uh, lady or gentleman stated who uh, posed the question, then of course, it's a bad example. Okay, no, that's excellent, excellent clarification. That's great. <clears throat> and that's what we understand here. It's good reinforcing the cultural context and the cultural the perspective makes a big difference here. So it's good. It, it's um, a really important, interesting question in the sense also that uh, across cultures, uh, the perception of what means freedom is, is differently yeah? and what equality is differently. Right. Yeah, it's, it's a very... <laughs> yeah, it's just reinforcing all these, all what you're saying. 
you have to really be aware of, of this. So what would you, and you gave us three, three um, places to start. Um, what, you know, someone who's encountering a new, new cultural situation, either someone new to, a, a, to an environment or they're going in as a coach or trainer into a, into a new culture. What would you, your, what would you start with? Right? Would, you, would you even start with the adequate element or would you um, just um, sort of really get into more of the other items or which getting yourself better trained as situational awareness and, and um, ability to making yourself that awareness, I think is critical so that you can start to do the other parts, which is to mildly adapt. So what, what would show their, your short synopsis? What would you start with? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, for for me, it's it's very similar to to agility. Yeah. I mean, uh, agility doesn't mean that you that you follow uh, a certain rules or a checklist or that you get certified or something. But agility is more a mindset and uh, a, a culture. Uh, so it 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 will for for a lot of companies uh, for sure take several years to become more agile, and you shouldn't uh, expect fast results. And I think the same is true for, for cultural, intercultural interaction. Uh, there are no easy solutions. Um, yeah, if, uh, uh, so please don't expect, I mean, there are so many books that really give you a checklist and tell you, hey, Argentines or Chinese are exactly like that. And uh, here are the most, the 10 most important uh, characteristics of Argentinians. Just memorize them and you will be fine. Uh, that, that's not going to work. So, you, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying you should not read these books. Uh, but uh, be careful when really applying it to your reality and don't expect that uh, every Arch Argentinian as a robot will exactly act as described in, in your book. That, that would be not a good approach, okay? So yeah, I actually think when, you, when you're dealing with the, the cultural scenarios as a consultant or as a coach and uh, you want to introduce Kanban at an organization, uh, try to use... Um, uh, these three uh, advices I, I, I gave you mildly adapt. Uh, don't don't uh, don't be arrogant. Uh, um, uh, a lot of cultures. Uh, I mean, you, you you might have faced that also as an American traveling uh, the world and 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 uh, giving your advice to uh, to teams of other cultures. That there is sometimes a kind of dual situation. On the one hand, they admire you for being from 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 a country that is very very successful, but then on the other hand, they might also think that oh, this guy might be a little bit arrogant or so. Uh, so I think you you need to to carefully balance uh, that, and and so that's why it's very important um, to mildly adapt. Don't give up your own identity, but uh, I think it's not a good idea to say, hey, I'm German, I'm American, I, I don't care about your culture, just adopt to me, I'm the consultant here, I'm the trainer, I'm the coach, uh, so uh, you want to learn from me. That, that's not a, probably not a good attitude, so I think mildly adapt is good. Uh, I think it's also good to understand that different uh, actions derive from different cultural values, and I think it's, it's very important to uh, to develop situational awareness, which is very difficult for us as members of a um, of a low context culture, because we are not used to reading between the lines. We usually assume that people are expressing things as they are, and and uh, here uh, reading between the lines is, is not an ability that we acquired necessarily in our cultures, because it's not a required. Uh, um, ability in our culture. Okay, great, great. Uh, we've got a good question here. Um, it seems that culture adds another level of awareness to the practice of situational leadership. Any thoughts on the intersection of the two? Oh, <laughs> that's a really, that's a really tough one. Yeah. Um, I think uh, leadership. Well, when 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 I uh, teach Kanban classes, what what I encounter a lot uh, when when I do that in Latin America, in, in a cult, which is a culture of of uh, high power distance, um, usually the Kanban definition of leadership, which would be 
taking responsibility, assuming responsibility for something that's not currently good and that we should move forward uh, as displayed basically uh, in, a, in a perfect way on the, on the cover page of the blue book of, of David Anderson. Um, that is an attitude that sometimes people in cultures with high power distance do not understand right away. Because for them, leadership is still associated with formal power, with hierarchy. And uh, leadership in the sense, it doesn't matter where I am in, in the uh, uh, organization chart, or it doesn't matter what my job title is. Uh, I just assume responsibility for uh, something that is not good at the moment. And I try to move things forward can be sometimes uh, quite difficult. So uh, I think also leadership is perceived in a different way in different cultures. And there are different expectations towards leaders. Yeah? And that, that also, I mentioned it in my talk, that also has to do uh, with the expectations uh, of how information should be passed on. So in, 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 in our Western cultures, it is usually normal when you encounter a problem, you walk straight up to your boss and you tell him, hey, there's a problem. We should take care of that. In other cultures, you might encounter a behavior that people just sit there still doing nothing. And I think, well, if the boss really cares, they will ask me. Well, I, I'm not obliged to, to, to go there and, and report problems. Okay, So the delivery type of information will be very differently perceived. Okay. And uh, I think that has to do a lot of, uh, with, with leadership and with, with the way how you as a leader should act in different cultures. Oh, that's excellent, excellent. Look out, one last question here I wanna to get to before our, our uh, long break here. Um, when asked about the team you thought was the best team you worked with, people tend to think about trust as a common denominator, which is a value. Mm -hmm. Watching your talk, I'm thinking about the cultural dif differences uh, is it is correct to say that in a diverse multicultural team from different with different comms contexts and mono or polychronic culture, it will be harder to form a high performing team. Uh, is exposing these differences a way to overcome it? What, what's been your challenges or experience with dealing with the <clears throat> multicultural team and turning that into a high performance team? Any any thoughts there? Okay. Yeah, uh, well, let, let me give you uh, some uh, idea on theory. Nancy Adler is a, uh, uh, an author on, on, on several intercultural uh, books, and, and she says that uh, intercultural teams tend uh, not to be in the middle of the road. They are either super dysfunctional and they don't work at all, or the, the fact that they are intercultural uh, makes them to really, really high performing teams. So you won't mm -hmm. find a lot of intercultural teams that are kind of in the middle of the road. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, intercultural uh, uh, or cultural diversity in a, in a team can be detrimental and make the team really, really bad because there are cultural conflicts, but it can also boost the team performance because you have a lot of different uh, points of views and, and uh, you merge them together and you, you get a super high performing team. Yeah. So I think uh, both can be uh, can be real case, uh, real world scenarios. And of course we want to move them to the, to a super high performing teams. Yeah. But, uh, uh, yeah, that's, that would be my answer. Well, thank you. No, I, can, I uh, certainly worked with some, uh, very diverse multicultural teams and they were definitely high performance. They would, they, they took advantage of the cultural differences and the diversity was a, was a definite benefit. So, um, so that's great. Well, thank you. This has been a fan. Fantastic talk. Really appreciate it. Great, great addition to um, our body of knowledge of understanding Kanban and Kanban implementing Kanban in, in uh, real world situations everywhere. Right. So thank you very much.